All right, so recall that what I just said a minute ago was that a free wave can have a sine or a cosine because uh, you don't know which way it's going and you have no way of figuring it out. Now, I'm going to prove that to you. Now, this, this is actually kind of gives me goosebumps because, again, I, I do this for a living. And people have tried to have thought of ways around this, what, this problem I'm about to show you. Uh, trying to figure out how you can figure out whether a free particle is moving left or right by some kind of experiment, by some kind of trick. Now, it won't work with light. I'm about to show you that. So people try to figure out whether there's some other crazy little, like, build an impossible machine that can figure it out for you, and no one can ever, can ever do this. Okay, anyway, okay. So why can a free wave not absorb light? Now, I mentioned it, it comes down to the fact that light is uh, angular momentum, but, but a consequence of that, let me show you what happens. Okay, so light, light's energy is hc over lambda, the momentum is h over lambda, a particle in a box is got this much momentum, and of course momentum squared gives you that much energy. Uh, so let's, let's do um, particle in box plus light. Okay, so what I'm doing is I'm trying to figure out whether this makes sense, what, whether the particle in a box can absorb light, whether it makes sense that it can do so. Okay, now that means that the energy, of course, is going to be, um, it's going to be the original energy, um, I call it EV, the original energy, uh, so this, this is like just stupid simple, right? It's the energy that it had to begin with, whichever, whatever it was, that's k squared over uh, h, h bar squared k squared over 2m. I, I don't even need to write that down. Um, and of course it has to have the energy of the light. Now I know that this has to equal, it has to equal p squared over 2 times the mass. Now the p, the, the p is going to be the original uh, p box, which will be uh, uh, k, uh, kh bar, okay, whatever, uh, plus the momentum of the light squared over 2 times the mass. Again, I'm writing mass out because m is now a quantum number for uh, rotation anyway. Okay, now when you solve, if you solve for the uh, momentum of light, uh, you, can, you can tell already you've got yourself a quadratic equation here which turns into a bloody mess, but the important thing is it is not h over lambda. You will not get that. So uh, again, I'm not even going to bother to try to solve it. I, I once sat down and I started doing some algebra, but it was kind of stupid because I'm trying to prove that I can't make it equal to that. Uh, and so as soon as I got a bloody mess, it's, it's like okay to stop because I'll, I'll never wiggle it down to this. But it's kind of obvious actually. Okay, so here's the thing. The particle in the box cannot absorb the photon's energy and also its mo and, and, and account for its momentum at the same time. So let me say that again. If it absorbs its energy, it also needs to absorb the momentum, but it just doesn't add up. So when you run into this problem in nature that you're violating a fundamental thing like speed of light or whatever, then nature's answer is, I'm not going to do that. So it can't absorb light. If it can't absorb light, you just can't tell whether it's moving left or right. So you're, you're screwed. Okay, let me, let me give you another one. Okay, this is a total aside because I'm just kind of tired. I know I'm going to start like stumbling. Let me give you another example. And I, I pulled this on some of you. Where is she? She left, didn't she? Yeah, anyway, okay. Uh, and I pulled this on the two people who have come up. So, so don't write this down. Don't write this down, but you're going to like this. Um, okay, so let's take a grading and then you shine light on it, and you know that you get like a diffraction pattern, right? So here's, here's the observable. You, you get a diffraction pattern with different, oh, what do you call them? Um, when you do Bragg's Law, it's sine theta is m times, oh, anyway, I don't even remember. Um, and uh, yeah, diffraction orders, you get different diffraction orders. Now, why, why do light spots, uh, why do light spots uh, show up? On when you do a diffraction, you know you do a diffraction of a laser off a of grating, you get bright spots, and there's empty space in between. Why do I get bright spots? Why does that happen? 
Huh? Uh, oh, because of constructive interference, right? Right, you, you remember that. Constructive, destructive interference, you're all nodding your head. Okay, now let's do the spaces in between. The spaces in between. Uh, what happens to the spaces in between? Destructive interference, right? Destructive interference. Right, you know that, right? You know you're dead wrong. You know you're dead wrong, that's impossible. That is utterly impossible. Now why is that impossible? So two photons, if the, the waves are, you know, meh, 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 they'll, they'll destroy each other. What's the energy of the photon again? Is that the energy of a photon? Right? Yes, say yes. Well, we're going to be stuck here a long time. <laughs> okay, so now you're telling me that the photons, what, were, what happened to them? What happened to them? Huh? They're gone. So in other words, you just, you took two of, two of these and you wiped it out, out of existence. Right? If the photons disappeared from the universe, then you just, the universe just lost two of these energy units. We didn't lose them. We just stopped being able to perceive them. Um, that's the same thing as losing something, by the way. Well, I can't perceive my wife anymore. She's not <laughs> anyway. Um, um, no. <laughs> so the, the answer is, you have been taught that the photons destroy each other. My point to you is that violates the conservation of energy. If you want to be a arch villain, build a giant diffraction grating and slowly, very slowly, destroy the universe. You will suck out all the energy of the universe as photons slowly annihilate each other. Wait long enough, the entire energy of the universe isn't the energy of the universe will be entirely gone if you do that. Or you're wrong. Okay, now. I know you learned this in high school, maybe in middle school. Now give me a real answer for why this happens. Now that you're senior in college. Given that two photons who hit the in-between spaces will violate the energy, conservation of energy law, you know, the, the universe has a constant energy, that's one of the laws. This will violate it. So what actually happens? Yeah? Energy is converted? Uh, no, no. That's a simpler answer. Remember I said that the particle on the infinite track never absorbs light. Because it would, it would, you can't conserve energy and momentum at the same time, and, and you're violating one of the conservation laws. Um, so what would a photon never do if it violates conservation of energy? Yeah? Very simple, it simply doesn't go there. A foot, no, I swear to God, this is true. If a photon's gonna hit a grating and bounce off it such that it will be annihilated with another, another photon, it will simply not do it. I swear to God, that's the answer. It like knows ahead of time that if I bounce off this way, I am going to cause a, you know, the, the black hole will form, I don't know what happens if it ever does it. A photon will see the grating and say, I'm not going to bounce off at quite this angle because if I did, I'll be annihilated and I can't do that. So it never does it to begin with. Right? And I swear, that's what quantum mechanics does. It does crazy stuff like that. So anyway, that's just another, another example from middle school, right, of, of how this stuff works. So don't write that down. I just wanted to point that out because most people are surprised. That you actually don't know middle school science. Uh, question? No question? Okay, so just one point that I just thought that's kind of cool. Um, I usually save that for a second hour. Okay, okay, so that's why that doesn't happen. Um, okay, now, uh, and I'm sure if I, I, I tried to work this out for a rotation, and it, I know it'll work out, but I have to admit it kind of confuses me. Let me show you, let's talk a little bit about, um, let's, let's go back to 2D rotation. Okay, and let's do the m equals zero. So this means that it's not rotating. So there's some implications for that too. That means that, right, it can choose not to rotate. 
And the last bit before we do 3D is that this has implications for uncertainty principles. Okay, so uh, what do I want to say about that? Um, so remember in the particle in a box, and maybe don't write this down, particle in a box, uh, you can't have a flat wave function for a particle in a box because it has to have kinetic energy. You know where, you, you have some idea where it is, and so you can't have infinite knowledge, um, you can't have infinite knowledge of its speed, and the only way for it to do that is to have speed. Remember that the reason a particle in a box has to have a finite speed, because if it had no speed, then you have infinite knowledge of its speed, because zero is a very precise number. So because of that, uh, it always has to have some kinetic energy so that it has some uncertainty in the same kinetic energy. Oddly, I know it's a little bit of a tongue twister, but that's how it works. Okay, now, uh, and you can prove that with the uh, commutation and all that jazz. Okay, now, a particle on a, on a 2D track, it can choose to not rotate, meaning you have infinite knowledge of its rotational energy. So therefore, you can have no knowledge of its position. So how does that work? Now actually, before I begin, let me prove to you that you, you have uh, no knowledge of its, um, so that you have infinite knowledge of its rotational uh, energy, or its, or its rotational momentum, which are the same things as energy's momentum squared over 2i. Okay, so let me prove that. But to prove that, I want to point out that, okay, so we know what j squared over 2i is. That's our new kinetic energy. Um, this thing, uh, I, I, sometimes I, I've had classes where I've shown what this is before, and um, oh no, it's not RZ, it's just R cross, R cross 8. So that is the definition of angular momentum, the R cross P, we had that mechanics class. Uh, I've done this before, I won't do it for you guys, it's just this is a nightmare. Uh, you can whittle through all of the um, all the vector uh, momentum is the del is the derivative of x plus the derivative of y. You can turn that to r theta and phi. It is hideous, by the way. It's as hideous as your homework. But let me just not do that and give you the answer. It ends up being h bar over i derivative of the angle. So notice that this is, uh, so I, I just want to point out, if any of you are interested, I'll show you later in office hours. This is about a half hour derivation. Turn this into a vector, turn that to a vector. This is where your ddx and ddy are. You know, you, you've already seen how to convert those into r, r and c and all that. And then you have some simplification. It takes a while, about 20 minutes. And then you get to this. So I'm just not going to do that. Notice that it is uh, nice and consistent with um, that this still ends up being minus h bar squared over 2i double derivative. Okay, so, so the universe works. Everything works out just fine, so that's great. Okay, so let me do, let's do jz on the wave function that we know. Um, uh, I remember that m can be negative, and so that's where our uh, our left-handed curves are coming from. And my handwriting is awfully bad, and it's just because I'm tired. I'll try to be a little bit um, try to be a little bit better. Okay, so there we go. And so what do I get? I get something again that looks very similar to our particle, our free wave. I get h m and the wave function, I just get the wave, I'm just going to write the wave function so that you, you know that this is jz. That's jz, okay. Now if I do jz squared, what I'm going to get, um, um, I'll, just, I'll just tell you it's, it's h bar squared m squared, right? Now, now from this, you should know that I have infinite knowledge of its momentum. Do I? Yeah, and, um, you may be thinking like, well, wait a minute, wait a minute. Let's let's say you're at, let's pretend you're at the test. Let's say I just threw this at you, and the question is, now can you prove that I have infinite knowledge of its uh, angular momentum? What do you start writing? Think back to uncertainty. What does it mean to have uncertainty? What's our measure of uncertainty? 
it's um it rhymes with andard. Standard deviation, right? Standard deviation. So what's the standard deviation? What is it? You do remember this, right? Average, uh, average, average, average of the square. Oh, minus the average squared. Square. Okay. And of course, this is I've just proved it. And, and again, I didn't I didn't go through the bloody math, but it's I didn't go through the bloody math. I mean, it's, it's unbelievably simple, right? So, so there we go. Okay. So we're doing uncertainty principle with angular momentum. This shows you that there is absolutely no uncertainty in how fast it's going, just like the free wave. Now, the question is, is that consistent with, therefore, I can't know where it is? Now, how would I do that? Now, the way to know where something is, is to look at the wave function, absolute value. That, that is the probability distribution based on its position. We're, we're in a bit of a funny land here because position is now an angle instead of an x. X is a little bit more sensible, but um, uh, but anyway, so we have an angle. That's what we have to work with. Okay, so I've got E to the minus I M phi uh, times E to the I M phi, because I'm counting on that you remember this, right? You remember that, that the absolute value is the complex conjugate times the, the function itself. And what is this? One. E to the zero, which is one. All right, now, the reason that this is proof that there's infinitely no knowledge of the angle, because uh, the way to figure this out is to do this integral over certain limits, and that's the probability that you'll find something over a certain range. But, but notice that, oops, notice that there's no angle in it. The, the wave function, the absolute value of the wave function, the information about its position is wiped out. There's no angle in it. So, so it's irrelevant, so it, which is another way of saying you have no idea where it is based on angle because the freaking angle isn't even there. So infinitely no knowledge of its position. Uh, what this does allow you to do though, so just, just note that, so here, just so you know uh, for your notes, no knowledge of position. And uh, just don't forget that that doesn't mean an x in this case, it's a c. Okay. Last bit though, we can normalize this. So this ends up being just phi from 0 to 2pi, 2pi. And the last bit is therefore the proper normalized wave function for the 2D uh, deal is, remember, it's one over the square root of that. Okay, so there you go. Uh, and, uh, oh, it's got to be a perfect angle. It's got to be this right. There we go. Okay, so anyway. And remember, I actually had you do this on the homework, just so I want you to get used to all this R base and these and all that stuff. Um, yeah. So I, now notice I was actually saying to two people before the um, in between. Um, notice that if you do particle in a box, now remember the particle in a box. This doesn't work. The particle in a box does have uh, ha has a non-zero momentum and a non-zero x the standard deviations. They're non-zero. Notice that when you square the wave function in the particle in a box, the x is still there. So you see what I mean about why I have no knowledge of the angle is because the angle isn't there. But when we did particle in a box, when we did have a legit uncertainty principle active there, when I did the wave function squared, the x was still there. So therefore, so anyway, that's just another sign of this uh, working, like in the particle in the box, are not working as in a free wave or, or a uh, 2D rigid rotor. Um, so, yeah, there you go. I, you know, another, another thing that you're saying, hopefully, you know, mathematically this isn't hideous, but notice that, notice that what you're getting a lot of is a lot of interpretation of the math. 
a lot more than you got before. And I know it's a bit of a nosebleed, which is why I'm saying you might want to watch this video more than once. I told you this lecture is, is really the hardest one. Uh, and then we'll do hydrogen atom in after the test, and that's also pretty bad. Um, hydrogen atom, and we're going to just do the Hamiltonian. I usually do that twice. I, I swear to God, I'll do the same lecture twice. I usually do, because it can be that confusing. Uh, with that said, any of, you, any of you have any questions before we go on to 3D? So, no? Okay, so um, now when it comes to, like, uh, if you're thinking, like, well, but what am I going to put on the test? Um, all I can say is, you know, I, I, I'm a little hesitant to just have you spit back out what I just said. Uh, I'll have a little bit of that just so I know that you're going to get a good number of points. So I'm always going to have a little bit of that because I want to see you get, you know, I want everyone out. But, um, but you're not going to come up with another question where maybe I'll just work the problem, but then I, you have to explain it, right? And, and you've just seen a big, long, nearly two-hour example of that. So on the exam, just do that again, <laughs> okay? Uh, note that you really can't prepare for this as well, so I kind of like that. You just kind of have to get it. And to get it, as I've said a zillion times, you're just going to have to probably watch this twice. That's, that's really going to be the best way. Okay, so unfortunately, double lecture Friday. Uh, question? Let's stretch. Um, yeah. <laughs> I'll just wake up with a cat right next to me. She goes right here. Um, okay. Rotation in three dimensions. Three dimensions. So we're still going to have the particle on a string, but we're going to let it rotate in three dimensions. Uh, so like before, the R's will just get mostly wiped out, except that we're still going to have a moment of inertia. So look out for that. Uh, there won't be a, a, a rotation. There won't be a um, radial wave function. Um, but here's the thing I warned you about, is that you're used to me setting up, oh, here, oh, anyway, I just messed up my shirt. Uh, you're used to me, you're used to me always writing a really long equation and saying, oh, look at it, look at it. it's like, uh, uh, like Maxwell Boltzmann, right? Started out kind of small, then it got really big, and it got small again. This is going to start out big and end bigger. So, no, it just does, it just does. That's why I was mentioning last time about how the rotational, when you, when, you, when you put kinetic energy in terms of rotation, it just, it is what it is, right? So, okay, so when it comes to 3D, and we are still doing a rigid rotor, 3D rigid rotor, right? So we had this, and now, now we got, now we got this going on too. And technically, we, we've also got so we got we got all of this happening. Now, and just heads up to let you know where we're going after here. Um, just trying to draw it as 3D as possible. It doesn't really mean anything. Where we're going from here, the next step after we do this is I'm going to cut the cord. I'm going to let R change. But notice that that would normally mean that the particle would just fly off. And that's true. Quantum mechanics aside, if I have a 3D, if I swing in the cat around by the tail, and, and I let go, the cat just flies off. God, that's a terrible imagery. But anyway, the cat just flies off, and that's still true for this. Given that our particles are always an electron, tell me how can I still keep it bound? How can I let that electron rotate but still keep it bound? You know, so, so I'm not going to have it on a string, but I don't want it to fly off either. I'm going to let it rotate, but I want to keep some handle on it. How am I going to do that? Add a proton, right? So if this is so. Don't write this down. This is what we do next after the test. Of course, the particle is still an electron, but to keep it bounded so it doesn't fly off, I'm going to make it out a proton. But what's that? What's a proton and an electron called again? Hydrogen atom. It's a hydrogen atom. And then we actually stop quantum mechanics and go on to um, that dynamics. Uh, so let's do the. Another thing that's kind of important is getting our coordinate frame correct. So I, I think you know x, y, and z. Uh, we get little hats, that means direction. OK, so this is kind of funky. Uh, it turns out that of all the damnedest things, that physicists and mathematicians got in some fight a long time ago. 
and they each use a different set of definitions for the angles. So R is R, so we won't worry about that. You should know R. Uh, but this angle, just like before, is still phi. But now, so this is the projection into the xy plane. This is our actual vector. This how we, oh god, that's tilted, isn't it? Oh, it can't be tilted. Or it will blow up. Okay, there we go. That's a little bit better. Okay, this angle is, of course, theta. Now, be careful. Mathematicians define this the other way, so you have to look out. So, I'm mentioning this because if you look online, if you just like, hey, I need to, you're doing the homework, you're like, oh, wait, I forgot what the rotational Hamiltonian is or, or what the angles are. If you find a math Wikipedia or whatever, those angles are reversed. Don't know why anybody behaves this way. I think it's stupid, but mathematicians define angles different ways. So be really careful when you look up answers online because those angles can be changed. This is the physics chemistry way. I think we follow the physics, not the math. So anyway, heads up on that. Okay, now you can imagine, um, now you don't need to know this, maybe you want to write it down just to make yourself know that it's not some witchcraft, it actually is witchcraft, I'm not supposed to tell you that, uh, regardless, uh, you've done, when did you do spherical coordinates, middle school? No, probably high, no, high school, right? Maybe sophomore year? I think I did it sophomore year of high school. I was in geometry sophomore. Um, right. X is cosine sine, Y is sine sine. Remember, Y is always kind of different. Z is always the easy one, so it's the lucky one. So there we go. Now, of course, we also, then you have to do vice versa. You have to define R and theta and phi. Uh, and you know all this again, you had it maybe sophomore year of high school and whatnot. None, none of this is particularly terrible. Um, let's see, now, theta is again, that one's always a little bit easier. Uh, R cos of z over R, phi, and again, don't worry about this. Um, this is not important because I'm not going to have you, I'm not going to have you do what you, what you can imagine that you need to do to do this. I actually did start writing this out one day. Um, to, to do the change in x, you have to do each, uh, each bit first. Okay, so there's the change in r. No, 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 no. What, have I, no, what have I done? What have I done? No, this is the r. Right, right. I knew I had done it wrong because it has to, has to cancel. Uh, then the chain rule, uh, do phi. Yeah, there we go. There's, there's a pattern to this. And um, theta x. The theta, 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 theta. Okay. Now, of course, using the, the definition of R, um, which has an x in it, you can do that, and yada, yada, yada. <laughs> then you have to square it. Then you've got to do y and z and then add them together and then simplify it. So, just like I saw, remember how I did the barrier, the finite barrier, I did it on the handout. I told you it's five pages long, it is pretty bad. Uh, but I did solve the finite barrier problem just to show you that, it's, it's a handout section. I, and, and you're basically doing the, the 2D guy, but for 3D, I started writing this out I got to like five pages and I hadn't even done the square yet on X. Yeah, I just stopped. Now, I know it's doable, but even I've got my limits. So anyway, so you know that this is how you would start doing this. Um, now, as much as I like to torture you folks with math, because I have good reasons and for your benefit, you know this, again, high school, you know this, you saw it just the other day, you're getting a good taste on how to do this. But I swear to God, this is the kind of thing that somebody probably sat down and took them at least a month or two to solve. So let me just show you what the 2D rotational Hamiltonian is. And you notice that I'm pointing down a board. There's probably a monkey or a TARDIS or something right behind me right now. I remember to put that in. Um, let me write out the whole thing. And you need to be pulling out a new sheet of paper, because this is the part that gets hideous. And it never gets better, by the way. <laughs> Uh, let's see, where am I at? I have to, I have to find my own. Okay, okay. 
So minus, how am I doing that? Minus h bar squared plus two times the mass. Um, now, hopefully you don't have any problems with this. Uh, I know I, uh, oh, you had, you had to do a three-dimensional particle in the box, right? On your homework, is that what I did? I actually wrote these over the summer, so I don't quite remember everything. Okay, so again, Schrodinger's initial 4A and 2 quantum mechanics was to write out kinetic energy, and God, I really wish that spheres, I don't like things that are round, and it's because of this. This is so easy. Planes, things that move in a line are easy. Oh my God, okay, so I have to start about here. I have to, I have to really think ahead of time before I do this, by the way. And I'm writing mass, so uh, mass will be multiplied by r squared in a little bit so that we'll have the moment of inertia, but it's not there yet. Um, okay, so I have two different types of brackets, by the way. So I get a double derivative of r, and that's, that makes sense, and then it really goes off the rails. Um, r squared, now of course, the R's, these will go away once we invoke rigid rotor, but when it's not rigid rotor, meaning that we're doing the hydrogen atom, uh, those, those will actually still be there. Um, okay, and I have to make sure I don't, that's a thing and that's a fee. I didn't screw that up. I really need to be very careful about that. But I will switch my data and fee at the drop of the hat. Oh, you're gonna love this. You may notice that I had you do something similar at one point because I knew this was coming up. These are all the things. Okay, so then there's this and then there's a the final bracket. Yeah, those... <laughs> so there you go. That is XYZ in R theta C. And I can't do better than that. <laughs> this is just how it is. Okay, so what I want to do is uh, to make you comfortable with this, I'm just going to like write it over and over and over again, so I try to think of ways to make sure of that. So what I'm going to first show you is that this is still consistent. Uh, so consistent, consistent with the 2D. Okay, I want to show you that, but I'm just again, I'm just trying to get you used to this. Now, you don't have to memorize this by any means. Of course not. I don't, I don't even know this. Sometimes I have it memorized by me. When I do this class, sometimes by the end of the class, I have it memorized, but whatever. Um, okay, uh, 2D, is this consistent with 2D? Okay, now that means that, again, the theta is 90 degrees, 90 degrees, and of course we know, you see all those signs? Sine sin of 90 degrees is 1. And um, uh, if it's rigid rotor, all the DDRs will be 0. They're not really 0. It's just that, remember, just like before, the radial wave function is just a constant uh, because there's no information to be had. Uh, if it's on a rigid, if it's on a string, it's a rigid rotor, the particle is always at, for example, one nanometer from the, from the center. So there's no information that the radial wave function could have making it a constant, and all the derivatives are therefore zero. Okay, if that's the case, uh, now, now don't get confused on your notes, right? I'm, gonna go, I'm going backward, but again, I'm just doing this to make you as comfortable with as possible. Okay, so that, that, will, be, that will be gone, that will be gone, um, that's, um, okay, again, I, I'm not sure what the number exactly is. It is a number. Uh, sine, sine theta is still 1, so sine squared is still 1. So I've still got this thing. Um, and then I've got, uh, so the wave function, the wave function in theta is also a constant because there's no information there because just like, just like this is 0, the same rules apply. If there's no variation of r, the wave function with respect to r, the radial wave function has no information. It's just a number because the r is constant. So the, the, why, why have a wave function with an r in it? There's nothing there to know. r is always one nanometer. 
if theta is always 90 degrees, what do, what's the wave function going to tell you? It's a constant. Uh, theta is 90 degrees. The derivative of a constant is zero. So this gets wiped out too. And sure enough, there you go. So it ends up being minus h bar squared over 2i, double derivative. So you see how um, <laughs> uh, 2d, not too bad, <laughs> 3d. 3D, all, the best I can do is, let's go back to 3D. I can wipe these out. I can wipe out these two terms, but the rest remain. And, and there's no there's no beating that. So, um, so again, don't get confused. Don't get confused. This is not 3D. This is just showing you that this is consistent with 2D so that the world makes sense. It's not too crazy, although it kind of is. Um, now, the next bit, which unfortunately I wish I didn't have enough time to do, but I do. Um, weird. But uh, anyway, uh, now I want to start solving it. So if we go back, so uh, again, we won't have the DDRs. Those will be gone. And they'll come back when we're doing hydrogen atom after the test. Um, so I'm going to write out all that angle stuff. And then what I'm going to do is, and, and I can't emphasize enough, two extra Fridays ago, I did the lecture on um, on second order differential equations. You really, the, the reason I want you to watch that is because of what I'm doing right now, which is to take the Hamiltonian, remember that the, the, oh, what's wrong with me? I'm going to see if it's separable. Now again, this is going to be wiped out because it's just a constant. It's like one nanometer, so the derivatives are not being folded. So I just want to see if I can do this. Now, now recall that I, the purpose of what I'm doing here is to see if I can turn this wave function into two functions multiplying. The reason that is, is that it's going to be way easier to solve. Now don't write this down. Don't write this down. But what this means is the wave function is not going to look like this. Right, so don't write this down. This is not allowed if this is true. Trust me, you don't want this. You think this stuff is hard? That I don't even know what to do with that. I have no idea what to do with that. If this is true, right, that means that is not allowed, but, but this would be. This is unbelievably easier to work with. This is what I'm trying to show is that the solutions look like this. Not that, that it is this. Actually, this is a solution, but anyway, it's actually the solution to an excited state. This is actually a three, this is actually a three people in a little white flag. Anyway, I'm, I'm, I'm jumping ahead. Um, but I just want to see whether whether the solution will be like functions multiplied, not, not like added or anything like that. Because again, I promise you that is too hideous to even consider. To do this, how, how do I do this? Remember the process begins with an S. Find for the separability. Separability. You have to show separability. That's because the wave functions are separated. So, and that's a procedure. And you maybe didn't watch the freaking video. So let me let me walk you. Uh, let's walk through it. Okay. The way to do this is to let's take the Hamiltonian. You're going to apply the separated wave function. I wrote that out of order. You're going to apply it on the left. You divide it on the right. The order doesn't matter, right? The order, uh, uh, apply it to the right, and you know that this is hard because there's a bunch of derivatives and stuff. This isn't particularly difficult. And what you're looking for is to find uh, that this comes in the form of stuff with only uh, a theta in it and stuff with only a phi in it equals to some like constant, which may be the energy or something. If you can do this, again, you can't have you can't have a theta and a phi in the same little term. If you can separate them into uh, one one variable plus another equals to a constant, then then this is okay. So this is um, if you, if you don't recall because you didn't watch the video or you don't recall the video, 
this is what separability is. So if you're seeing this for the first time, I'm to, you should not be thinking like, oh, I don't remember that. That's fine, I'm showing you what this is. This is an absolute mathematical truth that if this happened, if I do this, so I have to do this, but if I find that it's equal to that, that means that my solution comes in this form. That also means, if you recall, each one of these, because there's still going to be like derivatives in there, like double derivatives, each one is a problem in its own right. And that's where I find my solutions. The reason you want to do that is that these individual, um, usually differential equations, are way easier solved than the big one. So again, that's why you do that. Okay, real quick, um, I'm going to um, just write this out. Let me just write this out because I'm kind of out of time. But you can confirm that this is correct. Uh, so it turns out that this is separable. This is separable. Let me write this out and maybe you can try to figure, uh, just work through it on your own because again, this is just an exercise in, um, in absolute hideous algebra. There's really no calculus involved with this other than to remember when you apply a derivative to a wave function, like, like the, the derivative with phi in it, to a wave function with phi, it stops it. Uh, the theta goes through and then gets wiped out like that. So I, I hope you remember how to do that. If not, you can watch the video. Okay, so I've got that. Then what I do, um, I've got 1 over, uh, uh, what have I got? I've got 1 over sine theta, wave function of theta. I know the wave function of theta is there. Again, the DDRs are gone because these SOBs wipe it out. So the theta can't progress through these walls, but the C can. Okay, and then these are going to be equal. So what I've done is I've moved over the 2i e uh, h bar squared. I, I took the uh, I took those constants. I brought them over to the right, and I think there's a minus sign. Okay, right. So I took um, 2 mass r squared, which is i, 2 e is e minus h bar, h bar squared. <coughs> okay, so the answer is, and then I'm out of time, the answer is I did it. The answer is I did it. So this, of course, is a constant. Energy is a constant. The, the, everything else is a constant. And now look at this. Only, only thetas and only, only phi's. Okay, so there you go. All right, now this gets kind of nuttier, and I'm just going to preview. We'll do this next time. But let me tell you that what you're going to end up doing is we're going to assume that the, the, the phi wave function is still this. You assume that this thing, because this is still on the xy plane, you assume it has the same solution. And then that allows you to be able to solve this, which was actually done in 1790, oddly enough. So that's what we're going to do on Monday, uh, Wednesday review, and uh, that's on Friday. <laughs>